We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. So welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And this is episode 114. I can't believe that we're up to 114 already. I know. No, it's not. It is. Um, and what we're going to be talking about in this one? 104. No, 114. Okay, I'll believe you. I thought <laughs> there's a very suspicious look on your face, though, Bob. For those people that can't see on the it podcast, seem, it doesn't seem long ago since we did the hundredth. I know it's frightening, isn't it? Yeah. So it is. Um, and it's about running therapy groups, which I'm really interested in this, Bob. I've never run a therapy group, so you know, I can pick your brains on this. Sure. I was just looking at myself, actually, in the uh, very narcissistically <laughs> in the Zoom that we're doing. And I've realised my beard is very long. Um, anyway, I must go. Anyway, very, very long. You and must get it back. Well, it's, it's, well, I would say it's coming up to Christmas, but it's not, is it? We're in the middle of summer. <laughs> well, <laughs> but anyway, sorry for the people who are on pack podcasts. Uh, you just have to imagine my beard's very... A bit like Father Christmas, I think. Or they can pop over onto our YouTube channel and they can see you in the flesh on the YouTube channel, Bob. It's up to them. <laughs> a little bit of a plug there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, what did you say the subject was about? The subject is running therapy groups. And you never run one? I've never run a therapy group. Couples is the most I've done. I've done parents and children. I've done that. And I've done couples, but I've never actually ran a therapy group. Well, I, was I just... imagine it's a bit like putting fires out sometimes. It is. I was just thinking about when did I run my first therapy group? I think it was, I think it was about February 19... 19- 87. Wow. And then I ran one every week till I was 69. So back in 1987, I think I was 37. So it's like 35 years ago or something, Bob. Yeah, every week. And sometimes I was running therapy groups twice a week, three times a week. In fact, you could call me a group psychotherapist. I mean, I'm still running intensives uh three times a year i thought i i finished one not long ago so yeah i'm well versed in the whole arena of group therapy that is for, for damn sure and i see group therapy as a very important um methodology of psychotherapy quite often people uh how can i say this progress into group therapy after they've cut their teeth if you like, on individual therapy. And then they practice out the new ways and healthy ways of being in a group. So uh, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you can start in a group, but I, 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 you know, I'd be very surprised if you didn't have some individual therapy sessions first, even if it's only to find out what uh, you want to work on, what the group therapy contract will be, So it's highly unusual for people to go straight into therapy groups. You said that, Bob. I wasn't sure when you said, you know, cutting your teeth and you start off on individual therapy. I didn't know whether you were talking about the clients or the therapist then. Oh, no, definitely, definitely, definitely the clients. And um, it's very important because it it, it, it wouldn't be, what's right? I don't think it would be appropriate to go straight into a therapy group. I think there needs to be some time spent with the individual therapist who's going to run the group therapy. Um, so you've got a sense of what you're going to work on. You've got some sense of building up an attachment with the therapist. Yeah. Uh, you've got trust in the therapist. You have some sense of how many people are going to be in the therapy group, what the structure is, how often it's going to run, whether it's one hour, two hours, three hours, those sort of admin things provide a structure and a purpose and identity to any group. So people can bring anything to a group therapy session. It's not like there's a theme to it. Because you know, 
I want to say kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous or, you know, a therapy group around addiction. It doesn't necessarily need to have a theme. People can come uh, with anything. Yeah. OK, so now we're into what types of groups we're talking about. So there's many types of groups with a therapeutic content. So, for example, the ones you've mentioned there, uh, AA, for example, that's got a therapeutic contact, if you like to it, but it's yeah. specifically to drink problems, etc. cetera. Yeah. You've got addiction groups, which could be to do with any form of addictions, whether it be drug-based, alcohol-based, sex-based, sex um, computer-based, and any types of addictions. Um, so we have different types of groups, perhaps for different things. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, we also have general psychotherapy groups, which can deal with anything from relationship issues to self-esteem issues to substance abuse to many general things. And people usually come from their individual therapy into the group therapy where they have a contract with the individual therapy, uh, an overall group contract, if you like, on what they might be working on. And that might be to be less depressed, to be more relaxed, to be content, uh, 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 content with themselves, to whatever it is, but it will have been sorted out with the individual therapist that's running the group on what that might be. And as I said, usually they've been in therapy for at least six months before they enter the group. Thanks. So there's different types of groups. And also, uh, not only the different types of groups, there's different structures to groups. So in other words, there could be one hour in length, could be one and a half hours in length, could be two hours in length, could be three hours in length. Also, how you know the composition of the group might be four people in a group, might be six people in a group, might be eight group, you know, people in a group. And it usually is determined by how long the group is in how many people will be in a group. Um, people in AA groups might be more in number. You know, so we have we have different structures, different purposes, different identities, and different timings of groups. Uh, so there's there's a lot of classification in groups, and then of course we have groups that are run by modalities. So, for example, a Gestalt psychotherapy group, a transaction analysis psychotherapy group, a CBT therapy group, a existential psychotherapy group. We could go on and on. Um, so. There's a lot in the structure, identity, purposes of groups. Yeah. So would you have a theme, do you know what I mean, before each session? Do you kind of, as a, you know, the person that's running it, do you have anything planned or is it just literally whatever the individuals bring on that particular session? Well, again, depends on the purpose, identity and structure of the group. So, for example, some therapists could start up a group that lasted 10 weeks and might have a theme. Right. Like, for example, assertiveness. Yeah. Theme on depersonalization or a theme on whatever subject, really, but might have themes like you have just said. And that might be, you know, only for eight weeks and then they start with another theme. Or it could be for six months and then we start with another theme. Or it could be for two weeks and then we start for another theme so there are theme based groups absolutely okay. so uh, so it, it, basically it's up to the therapist what kind of a group they want to run where there's a need maybe in their area for the type of group yeah yes you're completely right um let, let me just say what i think is more the norm yeah i said there's many varieties of groups that are therapeutic content in nature there's many different types of structures, purposes, and identity of therapeutic groups. There's many types of groups which are theme-based, which have a therapeutic content to it. I mean, you yourself, if you never run any type of group with any type of theme or any type of uh, structure at all to it, Jackie? I have a membership, but I, I think that's like support based on therapeutic principles. I wouldn't say that it's a therapy group. It's more based on the principles, if that makes sense. I don't know whether I've been overthinking therapy groups. <laughs> well, there's many, many different types of therapy groups. I've just said different types of classical therapy. To group. If I talk about what I think the norm, yeah. under 
the term psychotherapy groups in inverted commas, we could start there. Yeah. So I like think I can, it. yeah, I think I could probably fall into a, in inverted commas, psychotherapeutic group uh, definition. So they run every week. So it isn't like 10 weeks and then they stop and another 10 weeks and they stop and another 10 weeks. They run forever. You yeah. might have Christmas off. Yeah. For example, you might. Usually often people have Christmas Day off or might have one before that. Um, but it will go. So like I said, I started running groups when I was 37 and my last group ended when I was 65. That's every week. Now, the same members aren't in the group for 35 years. You just years. read my mind then. I was going to say, this, it wasn't the same people for 35 years, was no, it? No, no, no. <laughs> um, but, 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 you know, when people entered my group, they didn't have a time limit to it. Yeah. So, for example, they could be in it. Um, I didn't take anyone in it that was going to be under three months. Okay. So it was long term, usually. People yeah. used to stay in my group up to a year. And then I could stay five years, could stay seven years. Um, I, I Looking back, I don't know the longest term that somebody stayed in my group, but I suspect it might be five or six years. Um, and it would depend on what the contract is and, and why they've come in. Yeah. Usually, they will have seen me. It might come from my clinical individual psychotherapy load. Which is usually the case. Yeah. Um, then we discuss what they want to go in a group for. Now, people don't just join groups without a reason, a therapy group I'm talking about. Yeah. They usually, and I keep saying usually on purpose because, yeah, there's many other ways to run therapy groups. And what I'm saying might not be known the norm, but I think it is more the norm. Um, and that is that the, the, the members of the group come from the clinical load of the therapist and they may have been seeing or in treatment for some time with the therapist and the therapist says to the person, well, I think it'd be good for you to join a group more than just me, where yeah. we can look at how we can practice those particular new coping mechanisms or whatever it is, or they think for other reasons that it might be useful for somebody to join a group. And that's nearly always the case. Now, I wouldn't have anybody joining my group who at least minimum, minimum, hadn't done three months with me. Yeah. Which is 12 sessions. Yeah. Usually more than that. So they, they, they built up a relationship with you and there's trust there and, and you kind of know a bit of their history and maybe whether they're going to be triggered in the group or I suppose they've got to be a good fit in an established group as well, aren't they? Yeah, I think what you're talking about here is very essential to the running of a harmonious psychotherapy group. And that is, when does, lots of things, when do they join the therapy group? Are they a good fit for the particular psychotherapy group? What are they going to be working on? What do they see as therapy? You know, how far have they come in their individual therapy? All these things yeah. are what you've just said, important things to consider before they come into a psychotherapy group. Um, As you're talking, I'm thinking my membership is kind of a similar vein, even though I don't think it's a group. You know, the the quite precious of it. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not sure how open they are to new members coming in. The, the mm. yeah. Well, that, well, that's a good point bringing up because there's open groups and there's closed groups. So, for example, we decided when I first started. Let's take one group I started in 1987 that it would be two hours in length. Yeah. And there would be eight people in it. Yeah. And therefore, we could call it a closed group. Yeah. Nobody could join it until one person had left it and the space had actually occurred. Yeah. And then somebody could apply to go into it. Or how they would apply is talk to me, of course. Yeah. And then we'd work out a contract and what they wanted from the therapeutic group. And then they would join that therapeutic group. But eight was the cutoff and eight was the close. So in other words, it was an in inverted commas, closed group. Yeah. Now, 
it isn't about the members of that group deciding who they wanted in the therapy group. Now, it might be some other therapists might run it that way, but the decision on who should be in the group was securely on my shoulders. Yeah. And they would come nine times out of ten from my clinical treatment caseload. And they would only go into a group for specific purposes and it wouldn't fit it into their clinical treatment. Yeah. And they would only go in a group when they'd at least had a relationship with me for minimum three months, usually much more than that. Um, much more than that. We'll say minimum three months. Um, so it would be a closed therapy group. So the main reason that you're saying that they would go from individual to group is to kind of practice the things that they've been working on in their personal therapy in a, a, yeah. a wider setting, in a safe environment, so to speak. Yeah. Well, number one, they get to know me. Yeah. Develop an attachment with me. And they've got trust in me. So they're, when they're in the group, they've got a safe anchor or a safe pair of hands to turn to, to provide psychological safety. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and that's really important. What was the other point you made? You said another point. Was it about that they would join um, for my clinical treatment? Rotor? It's... The answer is yes. Right, yeah. Because eight people is a lot of people, Bob, for you to to manage in a th therapeutic setting, I would have thought. It was eight people for at least 30 years. It wasn't until I started to um, sort of wind down my psychotherapy practice in the, when I was 63, 64, where I started to think about reducing it to six. And then, then you know, I was going to retire for working with groups of 65. So I went down from eight to six. And the groups went down, they were three a week to two a week to one a week. And then eventually, I think we ended our last one. Okay, I'm, th I'm actually thinking of the people in that group now, as I speak, I feel quite, I don't know, reflective and how much we achieved. Um, they certainly weren't people there from the start, but they'd been there maybe three or four years. Yeah. And I think there was four people when we stopped. So... But for at least 25 years, there were eight people. I've been in a group when I was doing my training. I was in a group therapy, um, you know, sessions on a weekly basis. And there was four of us in that group. Mm -hmm. But as a as a, a therapist now, I'm thinking how it's easy for some people to hide in a group setting. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to go every week and not actually invest in their own personal therapy in there but you know we get things through osmosis just being in a room and listening to the conversations that go on or other people sharing their things everybody in the room kind of learns from that experience yeah it's a great support yeah absolutely um but the different dynamics in the group it, it for you to maintain a certain level with eight there's always the you know, the stronger characters that talk a lot more than other people and share a lot more. Uh, and they're all now, here we, now, here we are. Uh, you know, seriously, I haven't, we have half an hour is not long enough for this podcast. We should no. do a, a separate podcast on different styles of running therapy groups. So I'm going to sort of generally, and we must honestly have a you know. We can do a part two straight after this one, Bob. We can do a part two yeah. next week if that's what you want to do. Well, we're now into different types and styles of running groups. So, for example, okay, I ran a style of a group which you would probably call a hybrid style of therapy group. Now, what I mean by hybrid is this, and that is doing in inverted commas, individual psychotherapy in a therapy group. Okay. And what that means is, is that the person would contract for a certain amount of time, 
in the group. So if there's eight people, they would contact for half an hour. No less, they can stop up to 10 minutes if they want to, but they've got half an hour. Yeah. And that makes that you are working with four people. Yeah. And the other four people have first priority the week after if they want to take it up. Okay. Now, if they don't want to take it up, somebody else will take it up. Yeah. So now you've got four people in two hours. Yeah. Right. There's advantages and disadvantages of that system. The biggest disadvantage is that there is little time for group process. In other words, there's little time, if any, to bring the group in. Yeah. And the only way you could do that is if the therapist had in their heads they, the person, part of the half an hour they give the person would include feedback from the group on any of the members who've got any identification of some things they wanted to share in support of the client. Yeah. Otherwise, there'd be no group process. Yeah. And what I mean by post group process is having time to bring other members of the group in to talk about feelings, to talk about identification, to talk about support for the client and the content they have actually bought. So in the hybrid style of the work that I'm talking about, individual psychotherapy in a group, the disadvantage is the absence of perhaps much, of much, I don't know if that's what word, absence of time for much group, group process. Yeah. Advantage is that the client becomes the star of their own treatment, not the group. Yeah. Second advantage of a hybrid style is that, in my opinion, everybody gets the time to work if they want it. Yeah. If you're in a group process style, it is easy, like you have just said, for somebody to stay more withdrawn. Yeah. And in your language, hide. Yeah. So if you had a group of eight and it was a two-hour session, then literally they would have individual every two weeks if that's what they chose to do. In the style of group I ran. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's, there isn't a set formula for running a group therapy then. It's down to the individual that runs it and the 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 you know the clients that are in there. The way that a psychotherapy group therapists usually runs their group usually is determined on the training model that they actually um, have been in. Okay. So, for example, I trained in 1985 to nine, 19, sorry, 1985 was into about 1992 in transaction analysis psychotherapy. And I spent some of that training in how to run groups, plus the fact I was in a psychotherapy group myself for quite a long time. Yeah. Now, the model that I had from it, you know, that I was, uh, that I knew very well from being in the group myself was a hybrid style of running. Yeah. So I learned it from watching the person, my own therapist, in this particular group. She learned it from, I suspect, perhaps the same methodology. And also, I think, and I have never asked her, but certainly I got training and trained in how to you how to do Gould, what is called um how can I explain this to you the Goulding's type of individual psychotherapy in a group. So I the model I learned was not only from my own psychotherapist, but also from the theory of a specific type of transaction analysis model. Right. Now I guess I guess that if you train in Gestalt psychotherapy or if you trained in existen existential psychotherapy or if you were trained in psychosynthesis psychotherapy, 
you would have different models of running different groups. Yeah. Often determined by the psychotherapy group that you might have been in for your own treatment, or at the very least trained in. Otherwise, you haven't got a model, have you? No, no, exactly. Yeah. I I I enjoyed being in a group. I think I got a lot from being in a group. You know, I enjoyed the individual, but I did enjoy being in a group as well. And I kind of, you know, the the four years that I was doing my training, I think I was an individual maybe for for two years before I went into the group. And I think that was a good time for me. I'd I'd kind of worked through a lot of my own personal stuff and was in a better understanding of myself and you know my drivers and all that sort of stuff to then feel comfortable to go into a group mm. and what type of group was it was a hybrid group or a group yeah based? yeah a hybrid hybrid group and it ran for two hours you know and there was four of us in there so we kind of got an hour each if that was what we wanted to do and there was time for group process in that wow with yeah, it only being a, a, you know a smaller group yeah 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 that's because there was four people. Yeah, yeah. Though it was hybrid in nature where the client was the star and took centre stage. Yeah. Like the therapist also brought in feedback and perhaps a bit of process. Though I'm not sure what, we'd have to define what we mean by process, which is, I certainly, I think it'd be probably be a good idea to have another podcast next week, just to describe some of the things that are coming out of it. We could call it, how to run psychotherapy groups part two or something. Yeah. When we talk about group process again, there's different definitions of what people call group process. Now, both you and me, I suspect when we talk about running a hybrid style of psychotherapy group, we're really talking about the way you've described it, maybe the way I run it, feedback from the group individuals on the therapy they've just been witnessed and any identification that came from it. Yeah. I think it would be an idea to do part two next week on this, Bob, and kind of carry on the conversation with it. Does it make sense what I've just said? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Because you, I suppose the person that's, you know, in charge of the therapy group will have a an idea of whether anybody's going to be triggered by the content of what's been spoken about. But the people within that group might not necessarily know people's backgrounds to know whether they're going to be triggered by the conversation that's going on. So I think it's important that they have a chance to feed that back. Yes, yeah, so in this space, is, definitely. Right. So is it, this is a mixture yeah. of a hybrid group with a feedback loop. Yeah. Now, if you go back further in time, you might have, which I'm not sure I would call a psychotherapy group, but you might have what we call feedback loop psychotherapy groups, or even educate, educative psychotherapy group, or even psychoanalytical psychotherapy group. But in the one we are talking about here, and the, what I was trained in and had my own therapy in and ran for 35 years is what I'm describing. Yeah. Now, the problems and advantages explain some of them. Other problems, anyone's listening to this group who runs style therapy groups, they'll probably identify with, or if they're thinking of running therapy groups, it'll give them some issues to reflect on. Number one issue that nearly always comes up in therapy groups is especially the way we are running it, that I've described running it here as a hybrid group with some feedback. Number one, that's not in any linear order, but I'm going to say one, two, three, four. One is competitiveness for time. Yeah. Linked in with competitiveness for time from the therapist. Yeah. Because the therapist transferentially is the parent. So it becomes like a family system where the if we're going to use this analogy, where the clients become the siblings in a family. Yeah, and I can see how that plays out in a, ther a group therapy session, definitely. Yeah, so yeah. you would have had that in yours, even though it was only four people. Yeah. 
yeah so what competitiveness of time competitiveness from time specifically from the therapist and wanting to be special to the, the therapist yeah ah that brings us advantages and disadvantages but it will be a common theme other issues that get played out with time but you know before the sort of time issues and the competitive issues actually often money and power dynamics will raise its head in therapy groups um now not so much in the hybrid style because the client is the star but it will and thirdly, people often individually or group therapy will act out over money. Especially if, you, if you've got a system where you might give discounts for certain people, like, you know, whether they haven't got much money or... I could give very various reasons why somebody, one therapist might discount um, a member in a group. However, all those sort of issues around money get acted out individually and even more so in groups. Yeah. Next issue for people in groups is to think about personality types. You, this is the therapist I'm talking yeah. about, the personality types to have in a group. So you sort of hit on it when we started and when you said the therapist needs to think about the right fit yeah for those eight or four people yeah six i don't think you should have two because that's a duo three is a trio i think it becomes a group once you hit to about four yeah that makes sense yeah yeah um, i was thinking somebody either those supervisors who has a group of three but i think that's more of a trio in my head but <clears throat> you see um when you get four five six eight ten i think we're more into groups then and i think the therapist needs to think about or the leader of the group who's the therapist needs to think about well what personality styles will make for a harmonious group here now again for people listening might not use this diagnostic model i'm going to mention or might even not um, use this continuum of health i'm going to mention but i'm just going to talk about one classification of um, personality traits people often think about is called the DSM-9 or DSM-10 Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And if we look at, uh, if we take the uh, that classification, we have names like paranoid, schizoid, hysteronic, borderline. Um, and we need to start thinking about, well, if we're going to take particular people who've got particular disorders into your group, or are you going to just have a group where you're dealing with neurotics, which is a different ball game? But if you're going to take people from different parts of the health continuum of traits to disorders, then you need to think about it because, and this is no um, discredit to the people on you know classification I'm talking about here. But I wouldn't encourage a psychotherapist particularly to have more than two board, in inverted commas, borderline clients, mm. for example. Understandably, yeah. And I wouldn't also encourage people to have too many passive-aggressive clients or too many schizoid client, clients. So if you had, you know, many people who are quite high on the passive-aggressive um you know, continuum, then we're going to have a group where passivity becomes the norm. Mm. If we're going to have a group, quite a lot of histrionics, we're going to have a group where people see their work a lot through feelings rather than thinking. And that might be all right, but if you talk about the harmon harmoniousness and process of a psychotherapy group, these are things to reflect on. Yeah, because you don't want the group therapy sessions to be challenging, but yet you don't want them to be easy. You know, if people have got to work on relationships within that dynamic group, 
you want them to be challenged to a certain extent. Like you say, you don't want a whole group of histrionic people that are all just working on the feelings. You want some people in there that are kind of more, I don't know, thinking people so that you've got thinking and feeling people working out how to communicate with each other. In a yeah, session. you're right. And I also think that one thing is to reflect on is where the people are on the continuum of health and neurosis to, to psychosis. Yeah. So if they're going to be, you're going to have a high, a lot of people out of the eight on the high level of the continuum where it's going towards high disturbance, then um, that's certainly something to think about because there's no people, you know, a different place on the continuum, say neurotic traits and disorders. So yeah. I think you need to think about how you balance the psychotherapy group and certainly reflect on these issues I've just talked about. Yeah. So shall we leave it there, Bob, if we're going to do a part two? Yeah, let's call the part two um, style um, styles of running a psychotherapy group. Okay. How does that sound? Because that's I would like to talk about the different styles between process groups and what I've just called hybrid groups where the individual um client is the star rather than the process of the group yeah definitely <clears throat> so we'll do that in the next one bob so on this one it's it's about establishing ground rules with the participants that are there so that they know what type of group it is that's running the the length of time that the it, it runs the whether it's a closed group or an open group um those sort of things you know how how conflicts are handled within that group what's the the point of the group whether there's a theme to it or we just bring our own stuff every week there's how do you contract for a group just quickly to finish on is it the okay, same as so individual the group? way i used to do it in the as i said earlier on i nobody just goes into any of my groups they have to have some sort of attach with me been in treatment with me and that's when you would contract with the group. Okay. And you talk about how you might sabotage that contract in a group if you did. So that all that contracting process would be done with me in the individual session. And then when you moved into the group, um, then you would explain to the other group members why you're here and what your contract is. But it would have to be a contract for change, yeah. not on not a contract for pastime, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've really enjoyed that, Bob. It's, okay, okay. It's made it a lot clearer for me. Oh, good, 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 yeah. good. Yeah, I think I've been making my ideas and thoughts around group therapy a lot more complicated maybe than what they needed to be. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it can be a complex and straightforward process. Um, but, you know, in this, and there's a, and the complexity is that over time and now there's many, many different styles of running groups. Yeah, which we will discuss in the next one. Mm. Look forward to it. Look forward to it. Okay, until next time, Bob. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.